Let's do it. Well, awesome. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the Open Minds and Open Books panel. Um, this is about faculty and student perspectives on open educational resources. My name is Ethan Roth. I'll be moderating this panel for today. Um, our panelists today are the wonderful Dr. Cassie Bergstrom. She is an associate professor of the psychological sciences. We have the undergraduate student, student of psychology and sociology, Holly Carlton. We have Daniel Mangandi Escobar. He's an undergraduate student of philosophy and psychology. And we have Dr. Bailey Peterson, an associate professor of philosophy. Please know that today's session will be recorded and the recording and transcript will be me made available after the session. So please be aware that we are committed to accessibility and that recording may take a few time, uh, some time. Other than that, before we begin, I want to go ahead and express a few thanks. We wanna go ahead and give thanks to the AOER Events and Promotion Subcommittee. Those members are Melinda Garule. She's a success coach, success, a success coach and advisor in the SOAR office. She's also the subcommittee chair. We'd like to give thanks to Cassie Bertram. We'd like to give thanks to Jessica Guerra, uh, Nancy Hankey, who is also here in our session, and then me as well. We'd also like to give special thanks to the OER committee. Other than that, I just wanna give us a brief preview of our session today. We're gonna to start with a brief definition of what AOER is, so we're all on the same page. Then we're gonna go ahead and move to panelist questions. Then we're gonna go ahead and move into audience questions. And then after that, we'll go ahead and begin our conclusion, say our thanks and end the session. So just so that we're all on the same page, OER is affordable and open educational resources. They're for teaching, learning, and research materials that are either free to students or very low cost, which is roughly $20 or less. OER include legal permissions for revision, remixing, and redistribution. Um, think of OER as textbooks, course materials, et cetera. The format of this panel, how this will be conducted currently is, um, sorry, I'm all in my notes. <laughs> how this panel will be conducted is I will briefly read a question, then I will go ahead and choose one of the panelists to begin starting the answer of that question. Um, so I'll read the question and then I'll either call in Cassie or Holly or Daniel to begin. Other than that, we'll go ahead and stop the share right now and begin those questions. Awesome. So for that first question, we're gonna go ahead and start with Cassie. That question is gonna be, can each panelist briefly describe their experience with open educational resources at UNC? Cassie, we'll start with you. Thank you, Ethan. Um, so I've taught at UNC since um, full time since 2015. And I can remember when the call first came out for grants um, for the first cycle that I think Bailey was actually also in, <laughs> in the first cycle, the call came out and I, I had no idea what OER was. And I went, huh, this is kind of interesting. I should look into this. At the time, I was often teaching um, our lifespan development class, which is PSY 230, um, which is required. It's an LAC course, and it's also required for a number of programs. And so I thought that that might be a really nice um, kind of trial piece for me. And so I did my research and learned more about OERs and uh, worked with some folks. I think it was actually Jen, <laughs> who was um, kind of the one person who was doing OER at the time. Um, and I learned about some of the repositories and the different places you could go to, to learn, um, to find OER um, pieces or full textbooks. And I found a full lifespan development textbook and used that the next semester. And it's actually the same text that I'm using today in lifespan development. Um, but I've since expanded out and, and done more OERs with more of my undergraduate courses. Um, and uh, it's been positive. It's been, it's, I've gotten really great feedback from students, from talking to my colleagues. Um, Holly here is one of my former students from last semester. Um, and Daniel actually also took my uh, psychology and culture course, which I had converted to OER when I developed the course. Um, so that's kind of my, been my journey. And now I'm on the OER committee <laughs> and very involved. Um, so thank you. Awesome. We'll go ahead and move on to Holly. 
Hi. So I've taken a couple OER classes. Um, I didn't really know what it was necessarily until I took Cassie's class um, last semester. But um, mostly it's just been like I've seen professors using resources that weren't necessarily just textbooks, which I really appreciated because I kind of find textbooks a little boring. Um, but it's been a lot of like, they'll use educational videos, or they'll use uh, excerpts of reading instead of requiring you to read the whole textbook. Um, as well as just like finding resources that you don't have to pay for. So like online, um, what's the word online activities, I guess is the best way to describe it. Um, and it's just really helpful because it shows you, you know, how many other options there are out there than just having to read your basic $80 textbook. Awesome. Next, we'll go ahead and move over to Dr. Peterson. Thank you. So yeah, Cassie mentioned we were both in that 2019 grant cycle for the Adopt and Adapt grants. And I didn't know much about OER. And as soon as I looked into it, it just hit all of these marks right away. And that semester, I had the sort of unfortunate experience overall, but fortunate experience as far as motivating me to really push ahead with OER, that I had um, two students in my epistemology course who were sharing a textbook around the midpoint of the semester, and they were like trading it back and forth and trying to do the readings, which is tough for a you know upper level difficult course. And I had another student who I was working with closely for a few years, and I got to learn more about her. And it was very important for her. She didn't want to take out loans. So she worked full time and paid her way through UNC, but she had very little left over. I remember that she pretty much relied on the bear pantry for a lot of, you know, um, taking care of her needs as far as food. And it was just clicked in my head that I could not ask the student who was working overtime um, as, a, as a server to give $80, $60, $200 for some of those textbooks that really she didn't have to give. So it just really made it clear to me that this was a direct way to impact students. And then, yeah, I was involved in the committee for a while. Um, great committee, one of, um, I think the most fun uh, committees to be on on campus. And I've just really tried to spread the word as much as I can, because I think it's a very low stakes way. I mean, you can get involved at a very small level or dive in all the way, but no matter what, it'll benefit your students. Awesome, and then last but not least, we'll go to you, Daniel. Um, thank you, Ethan. I'll say that originally coming to UNC, I didn't really know what OER was, and I just paid my way through colleges and I know, through like the class and stuff like that. And when it came to like selecting courses, when I saw courses that said that the materials were free or twenty dollars or less, I signed up for those more often. And it was actually Bailey who introduced me with to OER and being a part of the committee last year. And then I even have a little thing. It was on my desk. But um, yeah, ever since finding out about OER, I like, now that thinking back to it, most of my classes have been OER classes just because I am around the same as Bailey's example that I pay my way through college by myself. So I work full time while also being a student. So it's really important, especially for an, for an area like UNC that has great affordability to have these opportunities for students. So I've been semi-involved since last year. Well, awesome, thank you guys so much for that. We'll go ahead and move to question two. This is directed at the students on our panel. That question is gonna be, how many OER courses have you taken here at UNC? And did you go ahead and search for those intentionally or did you just happen to stumble upon them? We'll go ahead and start with Holly. Let us know whenever you're ready. Yeah, so um, I think I've taken somewhere between five and eight courses. It's a little difficult to tell which ones were like trying to be OER and which ones just didn't want to require a textbook specifically. Um, but <laughs> I've really enjoyed taking OER classes because it keeps it gives me less time or like it requires less time for me to go search for the cheapest possible textbook that I would need. Um, and I feel as though it gives it shows that professors are more engaged with the material in ways that they'll go find things that might be more effective than just reading a textbook. Um, I haven't specifically gone looking for OER classes. Um, I'm just more interested in finding classes that I'm interested in the material of. Um, but I definitely 
it was definitely a perk to see that the class was OER. So. Awesome. Thank you so much. We'll go ahead and move to Daniel next. Yeah, I will say that most, if not all of my classes have been OER classes. Um, it, it becomes a little difficult when it comes to taking upper division courses. I will say of finding OER classes just because of like um, open access textbooks and things like that aren't really as good as they are when it comes to like LAC courses or things of that sort. I know that all of my LAC courses besides like the STEM focused ones where OER and things of that sort, and especially when it comes to like 200, sometimes 300 level courses are OER. Most of the ones I've taken are, but it just becomes a little difficult when you do go up to those like 400 level courses, just because the material, there's not a lot of open access that the teachers can use for the students. So it does become a little difficult in that sense, but it is understandable. So that's about it. Awesome, thank you so much. This next question is gonna go ahead and be directed at our faculty members on the panel. That question is, what motivated you to adopt OER into your course? We're gonna go ahead and start with Dr. Peterson, whenever you're ready. Thank you, so I mentioned um, the direct experiences I had with um, students struggling financially, but then after I kind of got started, the other huge benefit, so this semester I'm using OER for my philosophy of religion class, I asked perhaps um, an unwise question with only two weeks remaining of, you know, hey, we have some space in the schedule. What what topic do you want to cover next? And the students chose a topic that I had never taught before. So we're currently um, working on a, a short unit on Buddhist philosophy, but I was able to just really quickly put in a new unit without, you know, I mean, I feel guilty if I had students buy an expensive textbook and then say, oh, well, you better buy another book real quick because we decided that you're interested in this other topic. And instead, that way, I just found another resource, put it on the website, went from there. So it's been um, just a lot more flexible. So not only, yeah, the cost savings, but then my motivation really increased with that. Awesome. Thank you so much. We'll go ahead and move to Cassie next. Yeah, I, I'm, I didn't mention, but I did have some of those, like, initial experiences like Bailey had, you know, conversations with students. And I was, you know, I hadn't been out of my PhD work all that long. And so I, you know, I had experienced the costs of textbooks and, and that myself and the very, um, you know, not much wiggle room in terms of finances. <laughs> for, and so that, that hadn't been, you know, in, in my distant past. And so I, I recognize that that's, you know, one way that something that we could do as instructors in classes, you know, there's some things that we don't have kind of power or control over, but the materials that we use, we do. And so it felt like something that was, you know, that I could do that was actionable, that would help a lot of students. And that was a huge motivator for me. And I do think that the, the uh, flexibility that Bailey spoke to as well um, was something it might not have initially motivated me for OER, but it has definitely motivated me to continue using OER in additional courses, um, especially even in classes that I've used te textbooks, particularly in classes I've used textbooks where I might have used one textbook one semester, but didn't really like it, used a different textbook another semester, it didn't really fit. And so, you know, being able to intentionally choose um, especially in in like my my psychology and culture class that that there isn't much overlap between the textbooks <laughs> that are in the field. I was able to pick and choose the the topics um, that really met my learning objectives and met the way that I wanted to teach the class. Um, and and that 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 engaged with students as well. You know, I I do a section. I actually have a chunk of a lot of my classes where I have students vote on the topics um, that we're going to cover for like a three week chunk. Uh, usually during uh, the end of the semester. And, um, you know, it would have, I probably wouldn't have used that strategy if I had, you know, had the students buy a textbook, then you kind of feel like you have to stick to that. Um, but that a bit availability of being able to, you know, develop a few, um, you know, kind of units and pull them in or out, depending on what students are interested in that semester has been really, really motivating as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. This next question is kind of on that same branch of that, that discussion line. That question is, how has OER impacted your teaching practice? This once again is for our faculty members and Cassie will actually start with you this time as well. 
Yeah. So, I mean, I, I probably should have made sure I wasn't answering all the future questions within my responses. Um, but I do think it has changed my autonomy in classes and my sense of autonomy in my classes. Um, you know, when I think about the first class that I switched to OER was my lifespan development class. And I had spent so many years, like, you know, revising and crafting the activities that I had students do and the assignment prompts. And so much of the class had, I had, you know, so much of the class became mine, essentially, <laughs> and it was my own materials that I was using, with the exception of the textbook. And so I kind of went, well, what's the, you know, I'm not pulling a lot of the publication or the publisher materials, I'm not pulling a lot of those things. And so, you know, it really, the switch to OER has made me feel more comfortable with developing my own materials and really taking that, that ownership of my, my courses in a a closer way, I guess, if that if that kind of makes sense. Um, so it's impacted my teaching practice in terms of, you know, I think I'm more creative at coming up with activities and assignments and ways for students to engage in the course than I had been. Um, when, you know, when you're using a textbook, you kind of feel, I, now that I had the comparison, <laughs> it kind of feels more confining almost in a way. Um, and I think that that has impacted my teaching um, positively. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. We'll go ahead and move to Dr. Peterson. Dr. Peterson, whenever you're ready. Thank you. So um, when I thought about this question, I think the biggest change has been making my courses more student led. So either from, you know, having opportunities for, for students to come up with topics, but also um, I've changed some of my approach to assignments where there's more kind of student to student assignments or assignments that can live from one semester to another semester. Um, and so, I mean, I was going to talk about that for one of the next questions, but I have an assignment, for example, that asks students to describe philosophy and what it's like in their first class, tips and tricks, things like that, because I've done philosophy for a long time and I forget what it was like to be in my first philosophy class. But so students sharing this document and, and having it be this living document from semester to sem semester means that students can learn from each other rather than only from me. So I think it's just the shift to putting more of the focus on, on student-driven learning uh, across the board. Awesome, thank you so much for that. We'll go ahead and move on to question five. Question five is also aimed at our faculty. This question is, can you share specific success stories where OER made a significant impact on teaching and learning in your courses? We'll go ahead and start with you, Dr. Peterson, whenever you're ready. Thank you. So the other assignment I was going to describe um, in relation to this is a living study guide assignment. And again, just an example of kind of open pedagogy. So expanding a little bit more from just the resources used, but the approach to try to make this something that's student created um, and having the students come up with study guide questions, responses, answers had, has made a huge difference in how well students are doing on quizzes and exams because they're, they're kind of learning this separate Skill. So it's kind of an embedded study skill that I can reinforce across classes. So that's been great. And then I've just had tremendously positive feedback. I have a little survey at the end of all my OER classes that is like three questions, extra credit, pass, fail, no, no big deal, what students say, asking if they've had a positive experience, if they have any concerns, if anything didn't work well. And it is just overwhelming. I mean, it's, you know, 97% of, of students have this positive reaction. And when they don't, it's because of, you know, something that I've then tried to figure out how to respond to that feedback. So it's just, it's working. Students are enjoying it and they're they're getting as much out of it and they're um, doing, doing well with their learning outcomes too, so. Awesome, thank you so much for that. We'll go ahead and move to Cassie next. Yeah, thank you, Ethan. Um, in terms of specific stories, I really think that the, I, I do the same thing that, that Bailey does at the end of every semester. I, I think I missed it last semester, actually. So <laughs> with most semesters, I, I have a kind of end of semester questionnaire and I have students, I ask students specifically about OER and, and how it impacted them. And the success stories that really stuck with me, or the, the stories that really stuck with me are the students who say, you know, I, it's been a few semesters since I bought a textbook. I don't have the finances, but I was able to still keep up with the readings and you know materials for this class because it was OER. And I think that that is a huge piece. Um, you know, it's really hard to 
learn when you don't have the materials and when you don't have the things that are are expected for you to have within the course to be able to get that background information so you can really engage when you're in class. And I think that that, you know, those stories from students saying, you know, that they really appreciated having not not having barriers to that material. Um, I that those really stuck with me. Um, I think the other thing, one assignment that I've that that I've kind of created and that students have really responded to and talked about really deep in their learning um, was especially for my online and and even in my graduate courses, I have students lead discussions and have them bring in their own materials for the discussions. I call it information resources. And so I didn't even think about doing something like that, like basically, you know, sourcing to my students, you know, having them find materials to bring in. Um, and not that all the materials would fit necessarily under the, the definition specifically of OER, but a way to really, particularly when I'm teaching in our master's program, which is all, almost all currently practicing teachers, having them, giving them a platform to share materials and share resources has been really strong. And I've had, I've heard really positive um, outcomes on that in terms of connecting and, and finding community in, in the, um, you know, for my folks who are teachers. Awesome, Cassie, thank you so much for that. We're gonna go ahead and jump to a student question real quick. The next question that we're gonna ask is going to be, how has the use of OER impacted your ability to access course materials? We'll go ahead and start with Danielle on this question. Danielle, whenever you're ready. Yeah, thank you, Ethan. I'll say that um, access to OER or professors who implement OER has been easier to digest the material just because it's more about like conversations within the classroom or things of that sort. It's more like active learning over like passive learning when it comes to just like reading the textbooks and having to do notes on your own time. I find that when I've talked with other students too that it's they mostly just do the notes for the sake of doing them for like when it comes to like for class uh, for like a class assignment but besides that most students just like read the chapter and don't really digest a lot of the material but when it comes to OER specifically or professors who sort of implement that having that like discussion of the material presented in class and sort of having more interactive learning has made it much easier for me to even digest it. Um, I know for example, one of my higher level courses in psychology, even though we had to buy the textbook, um, they sort of implemented other ways to make it cheaper, such as using like a more like older edition and then providing the resources that, the resources that's missing within that new book that's missing from the old book from the new one and just providing that as well. So I know that a lot of professors, even though that it's sort of harder to implement OER or having a cheaper textbook, it is, they have incorporated it to be much more financially stable for students. So it has made it easier for me to consume the material or have access to it as a whole. Awesome, thank you so much, Danielle. Holly, we'll go ahead and move to you. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, um, I usually spend a lot of time searching for like the cheapest option for a textbook if it's required, um, because I don't want to have to spend 60, 80, 200 on a textbook that I'm only gonna have for a couple of months. So I found that one, of course, of course it saves me money, but it also allows me to have access to it longer, usually because I will normally go to rent it instead of buying it. Um, and because I don't, because I don't have so much like basically anger of having to spend so much money on a textbook that isn't necessarily engaging to me, um, I'm much more likely to engage with material that one seems like it's had more basically passion put into it um, and is just more interesting and is cheaper because usually because it's cheaper and because it's an open access, I can go back to it as many times as I want to. So if I'm having conversations with students who are in a class that I used to take, or it relates to something that I'm taking in class in right now, or I'm just talking with someone outside of school in general about a topic, I can go back and access this resource for free or for a couple of dollars and be like, you can also access this. And so I can share that information with other people as well. Awesome, thank you so much for that. We'll go ahead and move on to question six or question seven in this instance. 
That question is for our faculty members. It is how to address concerns about quality and reliability of OER materials in your courses. Cassie, we'll go ahead and begin with you. Sure. Um, so, I mean, I think one of the things that made me most comfortable with the quality of OER was just looking at lots of them. <laughs> you know, I think that, um, you know, doing my own research and finding, um, you know, the, 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 the quality level is high, you know, the, the open, the OER, like for the text that I initially found for my lifespan development class, it was written, you know, by a collaboration of faculty who are all teaching. It, it's not like they're, you know, they're not, these materials aren't being written by just like random people who don't know what they're talking about. That it's often folks who are already dedicated to the topic and to the, the content that, that, you know, that I'm interested in teaching. And so I, you know, I, in terms of addressing it from my own perspective, it was just a matter of, of doing my own research and finding those pieces. Um, in terms of other, you know, how I would communicate this to other people, I think that the, um, you know, the quality piece is one that that you can just kind of show. And, you know, I so I use within my, I, I should provide a little bit of context, within my uh, developmental class that I mentioned, I use one text that was written, you know, from beginning to end, it's all the same set of authors. Um, in my other classes, what I've kind of used is more white papers and um, journal articles and things that, um, or, you know, kind of theoretical pieces that, that kind of are able to, that I compile together. And in those cases, you know, the quality of peer reviewed journal articles is, you know, good. It's you know, that's the whole, that's the foundation of our research and what we do is this idea that, that by having other experts um, review your work, that, that there's a quality element there. And so I'm comfortable, very comfortable with the quality of the OERs. In terms of the reliability, I think that that's kind of something that Holly was mentioning, you know, the idea that that there's constant access, you know, a lot of these pieces are things that um, if students wanted to, they could go through and save all of the readings, you know, that within the Canvas course that, that I have, you know, most of them are PDFs and you could compile that and then it lives on, you know, it's something that, that, um, that you wouldn't have to worry about not being able to go back and review or not being able to, um, you know, have access to those materials in the future. So I think both of those are, are things that, I address them by learning more about them. And as I learn more about them, I realize that they weren't really big issues. Um, so yeah, thank you. Awesome, thank you so much for that. We'll go ahead and go to Dr. Peterson next. Dr. Peterson, whenever you're ready. I was glad to see this question because I think when I started out with OER, there was still a lot of misconceptions or perception from faculty that maybe these weren't the best resources. And so, yeah, I really found not only is that not the case, a lot of textbooks are low quality. The last textbook that I reviewed before OER, I remember it came with all these test banks and PowerPoints, but everything was just very tepid and watered down. And then on the flip side of it, I found that it's really easy to kind of remix or readjust. So I have a Formal Logic openly published book that a professor of mine from grad school wrote. And Formal Logic doesn't change, right? I mean, it's the same um, there necessarily true rules for the most part. So what does change is the examples. And so I was able to make the examples more timely, more relevant. So you keep the lessons and the plan and the structure, but then change the sentences to reflect things that are relevant. My students will understand that it involves a lot of Panda examples naturally because I'm obsessed. But in any case, it's just made it easier for it, me to make the content my own. So I found actually the opposite. If you get stuck with a bad textbook because you're just in a hurry, you you know, that hasn't happened since 2019. But I had, you know, a textbook that I got. It was less expensive and covered a wider range of figures and thought, okay, if you're stuck with a bad textbook, you do what you can with it. But with OER, you can say, all right, we're going to omit this chapter. Or if it's a remixable resource, you can literally just edit it and put up a new PDF. So, yeah, I think there's just a lot of misconceptions and I haven't really experienced a lot. I mean, there are some bad resources out there, just like there are bad textbooks, but do your research. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. For our next question, we'll go ahead and move on to a student question. This question is, how is OER, how has the use of OER influenced your learning experience and academic performance? We'll go ahead and start with Daniel. Daniel, whenever you're ready. Um, thank you, Ethan. I'll say that it 
it has helped with my grades and things of that sort. I feel like um, OER in general or classes that follow an OER are more active learning. So it's easier to understand the material or even remember the material, especially when it comes to like exams or even essays, which like do take up a huge portion of your grade. So I feel like, and as well as it has built better bonds with faculty members. Like I feel as though I have a good bond with Dr. Bergstrom, even though I like just took her online, I felt as though even though it was very interactive, you are able to build at least that connection with students. Whereas far as I was able to build great connections with Bailey, which I've basically done everything in my undergraduate career with her, with McNair and even like my internship with Bailey. I feel like it has become better in like being able to connect with professors. I feel like being able to connect with the professors has allowed for a better learning experience. And even with it being more active learning has is better when it comes to like my grades and maintaining my GPA, so. Awesome, thank you so much for that. We'll go ahead and move to Holly next. Holly, whenever you're ready. Um, I definitely agree that it fosters better connections with not only faculty, but students, because you see the passion that faculty has put into it and defining those resources. And because of the fact that they're more collaborative, um, you get to access more perspectives surrounding the material and you're able to, there's more discussion that goes into it. And I feel like that's a much better um, format of learning than just sitting and reading something. Um, but also like, you don't have to worry about paying for materials or you don't have to worry about, all right, if I can only find this in hard copy, am I carrying around this 10 pound textbook? Um, if you, if it's a downloadable PDF or something like that, I love using my little iPad mini that I can just go through and I can highlight whatever I need and I can make little notes in the margins and search for terms when I'm doing my study guides and such. So I feel like they're just far more accessible for students to use. Um, and they just facilitate better learning and understanding of the material because you can really not only does the professor make it their own, but the student can make it their own as well. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Our next question is gonna be for our faculty members. That question is, what advice would you give other faculty members concerning the transition to OER? We'll go ahead and start with Dr. Peterson. Dr. Peterson, whenever you're ready. Thank you. So I think my advice with everything is typically um, kind of take baby steps. So start with what you can do. So if that means just reconsidering whether or not you need the same textbook, maybe seeing if you need the textbook and the access code, or maybe just taking the leap and seeing what you can replace and what you can do. So it's kind of what time can you set aside? Um, we've been so lucky to have so many grant cycles where there's support for faculty who need to have, you know, um, a way to honor their time and get these things done because it does take some time initially. But so starting small if you need to, if that means spending a weekend just looking at some existing OER, going to a website. Um, Daniel found an OER for epistemology that I used for several different lessons. So I don't know, um, that, was a, that was a nice fluke. But yeah, so um, just maybe start small and see if it works for you. And then if you need to take the leap, the AOER committee is super helpful and just so knowledgeable. I think sometimes um, faculty don't know that UNC is really a leader in Colorado and, and Colorado is kind of a leader in the nation. I mean, so we're really lucky to have a lot of resources available. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Cassie, we'll go ahead and move to you next whenever you're ready. Yeah, thank you. I, I echo everything that Bailey said. I think um, finding, I, I also think finding faculty who have done it before and collaborating with them can be really helpful. Um, you know, and talking through, you know, about, yeah, what was your experience like? You know, where did you go for these pieces? And I think we have worked, we've, we've facilitated some of those conversations on the OER committee, um, especially with new faculty. Um, but I do think having those, um, you know, being able to talk to people who have done it before is really helpful. Um, and so I would encourage faculty, you know, who are considering it to start having those conversations um, with other faculty members, hopefully faculty in your department, um, who might be able to lead you to some resources that they have used. Uh, but I also very much echo the small steps. I think, you know, I, 
I, I, I, I wouldn't always say that I work in that way. I sometimes take big steps. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm just going to change this whole class. But that's probably not the best way for a lot of people. <laughs> so uh, being able to take, you know, if it's like one unit or one, one topic that you want to explore in an OER setting within a semester, see how that goes, get feedback from students. And that, that typically is, is, a pretty motivating experience to get the feedback from students. And so I think that, you know, having that, the mindset of small changes can be steps to larger changes um, and we don't have to change everything at one time. Um, but I also very much, I appreciate Nancy posted in the, um, in the chat, the grants uh, page. I think having that, that can be a motivator as well. You know, even if you have, you know, your, you can be intrinsically motivated, but that extrinsic reinforcement sometimes is really beneficial for um, being able to, to take the time and dedicate the time to um, really deep diving. And so I think both of those pieces are big. But also, I refer folks out to Nancy a lot, too. A lot of people at UNC don't realize we have a librarian whose job is dedicated to, you know, affordability in terms of textbooks. And that's a great resource as well. And so I think having those conversations with folks within our spheres, but also across the university can be really helpful. Yes, I do send people your way, Nancy. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for that. Our next question will be for our students. That question is, would you recommend OER to other students and why would you do so? Holly, we'll go ahead and start with you whenever you're ready. Absolutely, I would, like why wouldn't I? Um, it's so much cheaper. Again, it's so much more customizable for students and for faculty. And I, I know there are plenty of students who go online and try and find not only cheap textbooks, but potentially free PDFs to like download of textbooks. And it's so dangerous because of the amount of malware that can go onto it or just like whether or not that's an actually good source to get something. Um, so I just think it's, it's far more accessible, it's far more safe, and it's just a better learning experience overall. We love to hear that, thank you so much. Um, Daniel, we'll go ahead and move to you next whenever you're ready. Yes, thank you, Ethan. I'll say I would recommend OER to students just because I've just found so many benefits to it of having resources that to make education more accessible to you and not, and call me biased, but I love all the professors that implement OER. Um, I just feel as though it's a better way of treating education because then if without OER education is sort of seen as like, if you can pay for it, and I don't think education is more about if you can afford it, more as like it should be accessible to everyone. So I hope one day most, if not all faculty members implement OER. And I feel as though um, having more students take OER is giving more incentive for professors to sort of transition their classes like that and even transition even higher level courses in which resources towards that text or resource to the material isn't just a textbook. Awesome, thank you so much for that, Daniel. I'd like to pull attention again. Nancy is posting the video that we have to find OER at UNC while signing up for courses. So please take a look if you're interested in where we can find that. Other than that, we'll go ahead and move on to our next question. This question is for everybody on the panel. It's, do you find that OER are more inclusive than traditional course materials? If so, how? Dr. Peterson, we'll go ahead and start with you. Great. So um, one of my favorite examples of OER being more inclusive was in um, teaching the history of modern philosophy. So there are a number of figures who are just not really included in the canon, Another a number of figures that I really um, like to think about in my own work for other purposes. So I was able to assign um, a, a big portion of the class for students themselves to pick a lesser known philosopher or figure from that period and then present on them. And since all of this is open access material, it's on Project Gutenberg, it's free, it's out there, it was just super easy. So that's one really brief way is that you can have more marginalized figures represented without making students buy several textbooks or something like that. So, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Holly, we'll go ahead and move to you next, whenever you're ready. <clears throat> okay, so, as I said, you can customize it to the faculty, to the students, and especially if a student is not 
engaging with a resource very well, it's so customizable that you can throw out that resource or give them more options to what they can use to actually engage with the material in a way that'll make sense to them. Um, you can also cater to student interests. So like our professors have said in the panel, um, asking students what they want to learn about. So you don't have to stick to a set textbook course list. You can decide on what students are interested in learning and really foster that interest in learning, which is what you want to do in a school. Um, you can get rid of things that don't work. So if at the end of a semester you ask students, hey, how did you feel about these materials specifically? They can tell you what worked great, how to change some things and like just what to get rid of in general, which is really empowering to students because they feel like they have more um, power in their education. Um, and obviously it's, it's cheaper, it's more accessible. I think that a lot of times it also allows broader topics to be brought in as well as um less normative resources which may touch on topics that like wouldn't often be brought into <clears throat> most university settings whether that be um talking about certain minoritized communities or certain social issues just things that may not be the most common topics um and i think it's just that customizability and it's just far more accessible because students can access it wherever and however they need to. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Dr. Bergstrom, we'll go ahead and move to you next whenever you're ready. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think it's a resounding yes for me <laughs> that I find the OER materials more inclusive than traditional materials. I mean, I think that, so I, I think it does come down to some extent, it's filtered through the, the professor who's doing it. You know, if you, you have the opportunity to be more inclusive. I think that that is definite. Um, you know, for me, I really, I, I really prioritize and value um, social justice and equity and pieces and definitely diversity and things that, that, um, that I think that the OER the ability to choose the materials through OER give me that opportunity to find those resources that really communicate well to the students in my class. And so I think it's not just a matter of, you know, it's not that OER necessarily is more inclusive, but you have the ability to be much more inclusive in intentionally choosing the materials, um, you know, to fit the class and to meet to meet the student, it can really, I mean, the, the student centeredness of OER, I think is huge. You know, you can really not only meet students in terms of where they want, you know, content or topics and things like that, but you can really, um, you know, have the ability to find those voices and find those minoritized voices that haven't been heard maybe within the, the context of your field um, and really highlight the, you know, within fields, there's different perspectives on a lot of things and a different, you know, kind of, it's not just one way of viewing topics. And I think that that is a hugely helpful um, way to increase inclusivity within, with, with OER. But I do think it comes down to the, the, the professor as well, you know, that you have to have that, that, um, that value of wanting to be inclusive for OER to be more inclusive. But that opportunity I think is huge. So yeah, I mean, I, I feel way more uh, confident in the inclusiveness of my materials with OER than any traditional textbook that I've used. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Danielle, we'll go ahead and move to you. Yeah, I feel as though OER is inclusive as well I said, I think in like the previous question that having OER and having education be more accessible for low income or marginalized communities is very helpful because now it's not more, it's not about paying for education or paying to have an education, it's more having access towards an education. And I feel like that's something that even like my family and people that I've know who are marginalized don't have the privilege of having like money saved up or getting a lot of scholarships to come to college and sort of get that experience. So having OER and having a way in order to have access towards that education and building education for yourself. So not only like build a career, but even potentially go to grad school, which is something I want to do. And um, having that access and having those 
avenues through OER and having that connection with not only faculty members, but even like with the university. Like I've gone to Annie to help find sources that I need. I even done like library loans and things of that sort. So finding ways in which you can access material materials for like things like research projects or things that sort is really helpful. And, and I feel like just for classes that just stick to a specific textbook, it does become a little boring or it you don't really see a lot of people that you're mostly related to, especially if you do come from a marginalized community. That's why I like taking Cassie's, uh, Dr. Bergstrom's course and finding people that were more similar towards me in the psychology of culture class in which our class voted to pick a more diverse set of individuals to look at within their culture. So it felt really encouraging and inclusive to see people like me being talked about in the in course materials and things of that sort. Then even with like Dr. Peterson, when I took her science fiction philosophy course and discussing like philosophical figures that aren't really talked about and people that you can, you can count as philosophers that aren't really credited for the work they've done and things of that sort. So it becomes not only inclusive for students like me with faculty members, but also inclusive with the course material that you can learn about as well. Thank you so much for that wonderful response, Daniel. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to our final question of the panel. That question is, is there anything else about OER that you would like to share that, the, that you did not already get the chance to? We'll go ahead and start, start with Dr. Bergstrom. Dr. Bergstrom, whenever you're ready. Oh, this is, I love the catch-all question. I think I suggested it because <laughs> there's always things that I think of as, as I listen to other folks talk um, that I think is helpful. But I did want to add on to the, the, it kind of goes along with some of the elements of question 11 um, in terms of finding OER materials more inclusive. I think that not just the materials themselves, but you know, one of the biggest things that we can do to, in, in terms of like culturally relevant pedagogy, is to offer choices. And I think, you know, having choices, at least in American culture that's very individualistic, <laughs> having choices is really motivating and really beneficial um, for students. And one of the biggest things is if you offer choices on reading materials or, you know, on different pieces, students are going to choose those that they relate to the most and that, that feels most accessible to them. And so that, you know, having the ability to say, hey, we've got three readings on this topic, or we've got these, you know, topics that you can choose from, giving choices and, and encouraging the utilization and, and actually hearing student voice in your um, you know, in your pedagogy and in how you, not just within class, but how you work on designing the class and choosing the materials and choosing assignment, assignments, you know, anytime that we can offer choice to students, which I think is more, um, it's easier to offer choice in the context of OER than in traditional materials. And so I see that as, as a really an, an additional nice benefit of OER um, that that does make it more makes a whole course more inclusive if we have you know some choices and more options in there. So that was one piece that I want to make sure <laughs> make sure we touched on. But thank you. Thank you so much for that, Daniel. We'll go ahead and move to you next whenever you're ready. Um, I'll just like like to reiterate the that having OER allows for better potential within um, student faculty experiences in which people that I've talked to, um, not only outside of like the professors here, but that with classes that have implemented OER or have made things more accessible to, accessible to students, they have found better ways to create opportunities for themselves, such as like, since I built such a great relationship with, Bailey, with Dr. Peterson, that I was able to create an internship opportunity with, with Dr. Peterson about my interest in teaching philosophy towards um, like K to 12. And I feel like if it wasn't for like the starting of having active learning through OER, that I, would, I don't think I would have the experiences that I do now. Awesome, thank you so much for that. We'll actually go to Dr. Peterson next. And Dr. Peterson, whenever you're ready. Thank you. So I think I can't have an OER conversation without mentioning this piece. So I know I, I say it a lot, but there have been um, studies to back this up and OER benefits 
students, we know that, but it benefits underrepresented students more. So the gap, for example, for Pell Grant recipients is, um, is lessened more with OER than um, for other student populations. And that to me just makes it just such an obvious choice. I mean, I feel like Daniel said it better, but cost should never be the thing that makes the student unable to succeed in my class. And so what I can do to do that, um, anything I can do to do that is really important to me. It's, um, it's a big way to make a huge impact. And so it's just, yeah, I mean, Kathy made comments like this earlier too, but it's like, if you care about making your classroom more accessible, this is just a really quick way to do it. So yeah, that's my big, um, I guess, drum I'm always beating is that this helps students that need it most, it helps them more. And it's kind of obvious if you think about it, if students don't have the ability to access the materials, they can't do as well. And so just giving them the materials, it just, it seems so obvious, but it's not always stated. So that's it. Awesome, thank you so much for that. And last but certainly not least, Holly, we'll go ahead and move to you whenever you're ready. All right, so <clears throat> touching back on the last question, the accessibility, um, I didn't mention that like, some students have a lot of issue with comprehending the language that's used in a lot of traditional textbooks. Um, so OER allows th for those people who have maybe a harder time understanding certain jargon or just comprehension in general. Um, it also just using OER, like professors using OER just shows that they have a lot more, from in my experience anyways, it shows that they have a lot more passion, a lot more interest in the topic. And I feel like you get more of the actual, you get to see more of the actual knowledge that the professor has versus when they just stick to a textbook. Um, and it shows that they care about students because they want they want the information to be accessible. And they're not just like pushing a textbook that they wrote on the students. Um, <clears throat> I think it also really helps students realize that you can find these resources elsewhere and it allows them to have more of an idea of where they can find um, helpful resources resources not necessarily just for the class but for other topics as well and it makes it gives them more <clears throat> I'm so sorry uh it gives them more autonomy I guess in knowing how to find resources and what a good resource looks like um which I think is wildly helpful for all forms of not only academic but also like outside resource <clears throat> searching and information gaining and it just like it allows information to be more relatable like they can go find things that they're actually interested in um and use resources that they comprehend and relate to awesome thank you so much for that we'll go ahead and move now move into our q a session if you have any questions we'd like to ask please feel free to put them into the chat now or please feel free to unmute and ask verbally if you would prefer we'll wait a couple minutes and see what we have Um, I have a question, if, if, if now is the appropriate time. Yes, please go ahead. Um, I thought of this in response to, I think it was your question number five, asking about specific success stories. I'm always really interested in failure because we usually learn so much from where things are difficult. What, so I'm curious, uh, I guess this is maybe more a question for the faculty, but I imagine the students also might have thoughts about this. Um, times when uh, using OER resources was hard or were there any particular lessons learned? Um, yeah, just is there ever a time where you kind of think, oh man, why did I go down this path? But um, interested in your thoughts on that. And if it's all been rosy, then just say so. That's a great question. Um, Cassie, we'll go ahead and start with you. Have you experienced any failure or growing pains switching to OER and using it? I may actually throw it to Bailey because she unmuted. So <laughs> I'm going to use okay, it. Okay, we'll go to Bailey. <laughs> I have two um, brief examples. Um, one just comes from a student who early on said that they just didn't like to learn from screens and found that part of it difficult. And I think it was probably Jen who tipped me off to this. I, I don't remember, but anyway, it turns out that you can pub you can print something like 200 pages free at the public libraries as well, like after you use up your like UNC printing um, capacity. So I was able to find a solution. So I, I, that clicked for me that I need to tell students about 
look, if you can't, because I honestly, I don't read on screens as easily. So I um, print out and use many, many pages all the time. I, I double side, but it doesn't matter. And um, yeah, so that piece. And then the other piece where I struggled a little bit is like Cassie, I do not take my own advice of like taking baby steps. And I um, tried to leap in and I decided I was going to create my own OER textbook and I got everything set up and I just didn't have um, the time or bandwidth to do that. So um, yeah, so that was maybe a mistake on my part to, that maybe that's why I, I needed to come up with that piece of advice, but nothing that has made me stray from it, just thinking about what can I do to meet students needs if they don't want to read from a screen. Cool, thank you. Thank you so much. And then now we'll go ahead and move to okay. <laughs> no, Thank you. Um, I do think that the the thinking through the, the printing piece was big and communicating that to students in terms of where they can go to get free printing. Um, I think that that's really helpful. I did have in my first, um, my first iteration when I was using, when I went over and was using the text for the human development book. So it was a full text and they had their own website and they had, you know, all of the stuff integrated into the website. Um, but I heard from students that first semester that it was kind of a hassle to have to click out and find where we were in the text um, on a different website. And that was part of, honestly, part of the reason I always hated like publisher materials is that the students would have to leave Canvas and go to a different website. And so I, the next iteration, the next round, I spent, I carved out some time before the semester started and actually imported all of the stuff into Canvas. And it was like literally me copying and pasting pages after pages. But at the same time, once I did that once, you know, every other time I've taught the course, I can just take all of that material and put it into Canvas. And so it's already there. Um, and I have gone back and updated it because they've updated the textbook. That's the downside is that they update the textbooks online. And if I'm, you know, doing the copy paste thing, then I don't get those updates. And so every, you know, other year or something like that, I'll go back and redo it so that that, that is more up to date. But I also do provide students the link out to the full text. But for the accessibility piece, and if they want to print it, but definitely the link to the full text is the way to go because then they can see the PDF and have that printed. But for most students who, for whom reading it in Canvas is more accessible, um, you know, if they have screen readers or stuff like that, you know, then it's, you, you know, having it in Canvas can be really helpful. Um, so I, I kind of overcame it in that way. Um, but it, it did take a little bit of thinking and feedback to get to that point. <laughs> yeah, good question though. Thank you for asking. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. It looks like we have about a minute left. So I do wanna be able to throw that question real quick to our students on this panel, if they'd like to respond to that, that they've experienced any growing pains um, while entering a course with OER. If not, that's okay. And we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um. I would say I wouldn't, I haven't really had any issues specifically with OER resources in general. It's more just like the learning curve of the professor and figuring out the um, the organization of the material because it becomes a little difficult sometimes when you have to balance a, a bunch of different resources that you're using. Um, but over overall, like the use of OER has been overwhelmingly just positive. Awesome. That is good to hear. So we will go ahead and conclude this panel. I'd like to thank you all so much for joining us today, um, especially our panelists. We had some very wonderful and really thoughtful responses. So thank you guys so much for taking your time. I'd also like to thank all of our attendees for showing up and giving us your time. I know it's a really busy time of the semester, so we really appreciate that. Other than that, I'd like to remind all of our attendees that everybody who registered will receive an edited copy of this recording. So please just be on the lookout for that soon. And if you have any other questions or inquiries about OER, um, please feel free to reach out to our affordability librarian, Nancy. She has been monitoring the chat this whole time and is so wonderful. Um, I'm biased because I work for her, but please feel free to reach out. Um, and other than that, thank you guys so much for coming and congratulations to Holly and Daniel for graduating. Congratulations, you guys. So thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.